all First Nations people who may be with us today, and to those who are particularly carrying the load of the discourse that's occurring in our community at this particular time. For together they hold the memories, the traditions and the culture and the hopes of all Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander peoples. We express our gratitude in the sharing of this land and waterways, our sorrow for the personal, spiritual and cultural costs of that sharing and our hope that we may walk forward together in harmony in the spirit of healing and truth-telling expressed so clearly and deeply in the Uluru Statement of the Heart. Always was and always will be. So as I said a little earlier, um, we're so excited to be launching our refreshed strategy for the Loddon Mallee region, Her Health Matters, and today's focus being Her Pleasure Matters. We've got a wonderful um, conversation ahead of us, and I'd like to hand across to Belinda Buck um, from Women's Health God and Mally, our, um, uh, got to get this right, Belinda, but um, basically our um, manager of our um, strategy partnerships um, and programs who will facilitate today's discussion. So thank you, Belinda. Thanks very much, Tricia. And yes, my name is Belinda Buck. I'm the Strategies, Programs and Partnerships Manager, bit of a mouthful, from Women's Health Lotta Mallee. And um, yeah, we're really excited to have everyone join us this morning so we can engage in some interesting and informative discussions about women's sexual reproductive health and in particular a key area of our sexual reproductive health strategy, living a sexually healthy life. But first, some brief housekeeping before we get started. Um, the event is being recorded so we can provide the opportunity for others to view the launch if they were unable to make it today. Um, a warm welcome to Kelly and Ali from Auslan Services. Uh, they'll be providing Auslan translation today and um, there will also be some closed captions. Um, I think it's important that we acknowledge that conversations around Sexual and reproductive health can be distressing for some and note that we do touch upon some sensitive topics, including sexual assault, as it relates to the importance of body safety. So if you find yourself in need of support during any conversations, there are services that it will be shared by the chat um, that can provide um, additional information on how to seek support. Otherwise, please feel free to chat, um, send a message in our chat and we can follow up with you after the event. Um, so to kick off today's event, we'll commence with an insightful overview of our new Her Health Matters Sexual Reproductive Health Strategy. And then we have the privilege of viewing a presentation by our keynote speaker, Anita Brown-Major, uh, followed by a rich panellist discussion around sexual and reproductive health with Anita and our other three panellists, who I'll introduce to you in a little while. Um, throughout the event, please feel free to pop any questions you may have for the panellists in the chat or Q&A window, and we'll endeavour to uh, dedicate some time to answer. However, the session is jam-packed, so if time doesn't permit, we'll follow up and, and when we send out our resources after the event. So I'd now like to introduce you to Catherine Evans, uh, Women's Health Lord and Mallee's uh, Sexual Reproductive Health Promotion Officer who's going to now provide us with an overview of our new strategy. So thanks, Kath, over to you. Thank you, Belinda. I'll just share my screen. So hello everyone, I'm Catherine, my pronouns are she, her, and my role here at Women's Health Florida Mallee is Health Promotion Officer, Sexual and Reproductive Health. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Jaja Run Country, where I'm joining you from today in Bendigo. Uh, so today I'll be, be providing an overview of what is sexual and reproductive health, um, sex positivity and pleasure, our health our Her Health Matters strategy, highlighting the strategic priorities of living a sexually healthy life and knowing your body. And lastly, uh, advocacy and next steps. As a health promotion organisation, we work upstream within the space of primary prevention. We have a strategic focus on advancing gender equity, which involves leading cultural and structural change, improving sexual and reproductive health, prevention of violence against women, 
mental health and well-being, and women in a changing society, which acknowledges the gendered impact of climate change on women. Women's Health Order Mali um, recognises that women in our communities are diverse and have a variety of needs, circumstances and aspirations that affect their lives and their health. Those who experience disadvantage when it comes to power, privilege and access to resources have an increased risk of poorer health outcomes. We utilise an intersectional feminist framework to recognise these diverse needs by considering how people may experience multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination and disadvantage based on characteristics of identity such as gender, race, religion, socioeconomic class, sexual orientation and disability. It provides an understanding of an individual's lived experience, including their sexual and reproductive health and well-being. <clears throat> Our vision at Women's Health Lot of Mali is equity in health and well-being for women of the Lot and Mali region. Our purpose is to lead cultural and structural change to improve women's lives based on a deep understanding of women's experiences and stories. So what is sexual and reproductive health? Sexual and reproductive health is not only about the physical. Good sexual and reproductive health is important for women's general health and well-being. It includes the right to healthy and respectful relationships and access to health information and services that are inclusive, safe and appropriate. This includes access to effective and affordable methods of contraception and timely support and services in relation to unintended pregnancy. It is also central to their ability to make choices and decisions about their lives, including when or whether to consider having children. The ability of an individual to achieve sexual and reproductive health and well-being depends on their awareness of and access to comprehensive, good quality information about sex and sexuality, knowledge about the risks they may face and their vulnerability to adverse consequences of unprotected sexual activity, ability to access sexual health care and living in an environment that affirms and promotes sexual health. Good sexual and reproductive health also encompasses sex positivity and pleasure. Sex positivity refers to an ideology that promotes with respect to gender and sexuality, being open-minded, non-judgmental and respectful of personal sexual autonomy when there is consent. Positive sexual health is not only crucial for individuals, but also the well-being of couples, families and entire communities. Positive sexual health encompasses pleasure, uh, sorry, pleasurable sexual experiences that are safe, consensual and free from coercion, discrimination or violence. It also includes access to evidence-based information and safe and accessible health services that are provided free from stigma and discrimination. Consent and pleasure are key components of safer sex education. Furthermore, emerging evidence suggests that positive sex education that encompasses female pleasure can act as a protective factor and potentially reduce the risk of sexual violence. <clears throat> the Lod and Mali region is predominantly rural in nature, which presents particular challenges in sexual and reproductive health related to service availability, confidentiality, choice and appropriateness of service delivery. Women in the Lod and Mali region are shown to have poorer health outcomes than those who live in major cities. These geographical challenges pose a further barrier to service access for diverse population groups, including young people, First Nation Australians, gender diverse people, sexuality diverse people, people with a disability and people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. As such, we focus on these population groups as priority within the strategy. The Her Health Matters strategy is a conceptual and planning tool designed to guide collaborative action across the Lotta Mali region. It summarises the strategic priorities, priority populations and actions that will be implemented throughout the strategy. It aims to not only guide the work of Women's Health Lotta Mali, but to support all partners and stakeholders across the Lotta Mali region who are either currently or undertaking or plan to undertake future work in the space of sexual and reproductive health. Our vision is that all women across the Lodden Mali region can access supportive, evidence-based and culturally responsive sexual and reproductive health services provided free of judgment and discrimination. Community support and promote positive approaches to sexuality and its expression, which enables and empowers women to enjoy safe, respectful, pleasurable relationships and to have their voices heard. 
The Her Health Matters strategy and implementation plan prioritises a primary prevention approach as opposed to a focus on early intervention or response and recovery from early stage or pre-existing health conditions. A primary prevention approach aims to address the social determinants of sexual and reproductive health, prevent ill health and promote health equity by addressing the disparities caused by gender inequality. There is a proposed list of actions throughout the document, as well as an outcomes framework. The outcomes framework presents a high level overview of the potential outputs and outcomes that can be monitored. The social determinants of health are included to indicate needs and highlight areas of priority. For example, health, social or place-based need and the strategic priorities are included to ensure the framework remains focused on the goals of the strategy. In addition, suggested indicators and data sources for monitoring impact have been provided. Although the terminology used throughout the strategy generally refers to women and girls, this is not intended to be exclusionary. Women's Health Order Mali refers to women to include anyone who lives and identifies as a woman. In reference to women, our work in sexual and reproductive health advocacy also extends to include all transgender, non-binary and gender diverse people who may access women's sexual and reproductive health services. The strategy is informed by local evidence and was prepared in consultation with the local sexual and reproductive health workforce, primary prevention practitioners and the voices of women in the Lot and Mali region. These voices, experiences and stories must remain central to all related activity. Women's Health Lot and Mali engaged Health Consult to assist in the review and stakeholder engagement, which included consultation with Women's Health Lot and Mali staff, executive management and members of the Board of Management, service providers from across the Lot and Mali region and representatives from the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisation, VATCHO. Women's Health Lot and Mali also led stakeholder engagement with consumers in the Lot and Mali region through three focus groups and an online survey. Our strategic priorities within the strategy are living a sexually healthy life. Individuals are empowered to have safe, respectful and pleasurable relationships. Knowing your body, individuals understand and are supported to manage their own health, particularly conditions and transitions related to their reproductive health system. Having reproductive choices, individuals have an improved understanding of access to contraception, termination of pregnancy, fertility and birth services, finding the right care, sexual and reproductive health information and services are provided in a manner that is non-judgmental, easily understood, free from discrimination, geographically and financially accessible and sex positive. Working together, communities and health services collaborate to ensure sexual and reproductive health information and services are appropriate, flexible, innovative and effective. In line with today's theme, I'll be providing an overview of living a sexually healthy life and knowing your body and detailing what we heard from service providers and stakeholders and community. Living a sexually healthy life. A sexually healthy life includes sex positivity, pleasure, respect, and access to evidence-based information about sexual education and consent. An example of what we heard, a, positive, a body positive, sex positive, integrated health approach to sexual health is required. Sexual health was described by service providers as not merely the absence of disease and infections, but consent, relationships, and pleasure as well. Using a sex positive approach will remove stigma and support women in achieving fulfilling and pleasurable sex lives. There needs to be more education around informed consent. It was reported that there are still a lot of people that don't know what consent means and that at the core, there is a system that condones violence against women and does not respect informed consent or informed decline. Education in schools needs to improve. It was reported that you were always hearing a lack of sex education in schools. People are not promiscuous. There is just a lack of education. Service providers highlighted that there needs to be targeted, simplified education, starting from the beginning, basic anatomy, and small sessions more regularly to, to provide opportunity to take in the information rather than one big session. There also needs to be upskilling of staff to feel confident in delivering respectful relationship education. Furthermore, consumers stated that young people are receiving zero LGBTI plus education in school. When they are a captive audience, there is a lack of access to reputable information and resources. 
knowing your body. Knowing your body includes an understanding of reproductive health across the different life stages and transitions, including puberty, menopause, and aging. <clears throat> Healthy aging begins at preconception and continues through life stages, including birth, puberty, fertility, motherhood, perimenopause, and menopause. Taking a life course approach is important as different life transitions are associated with different health needs. What we heard, sexual and reproductive health needs to be redefined for older people. It was identified that there is a preconception that older people do not have sex, where in fact, older people still have sex uh, during, before and after menopause. There is a lack of understanding about menstruation, perimenopause and menopause. Women felt that when you add anything to do with hormones or, or the cycle, there is this thing of suck it up. There's this continuum of lack of understanding or a lack of empathy, which is a larger social issue. So with what we've heard, where to from now? The key actions outlined in the strategy include creates connections. For Women's Health Lord Amelie, this includes facilitating partnerships that make a difference grows capacity and build knowledge through skills, resources, and expertise about gender equity, amplify voices, empowering all women to actively participate, be heard, and listen to, develop solutions. This involves taking action to lead cultural and social change. Centering women's voices and health is crucial for creating a more inclusive and comprehensive approach to healthcare. Women have unique perspectives, experiences and specific health needs that must be acknowledged and addressed. As a Victorian government funded, not for profit, but for purpose organisation, Women's Health Automelli are positioned well to advocate for what the women across community are telling us. Advocacy for sexual and reproductive health, including reproductive rights, involves a collection of strategies that can be used to achieve social, economic, political, cultural, legal, and civil change in the sexual and reproductive health sphere. Advocacy is important because issues related to sexual and reproductive health are often stigmatized by society and deprioritized by governments. Sexual and reproductive health strategies need political support and advocacy is often required to motivate governments towards change. Following on from our launch event today, we will be reaching out to interested partners and stakeholders to continue conversations around sexual and reproductive health and how the strategy may be able to support the work that is happening across the region. So please feel free to reach out to us and keep the conversation going. Lastly, please feel free to share the Her Health Matters strategy far and wide. It's available on our website and a link has been provided in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was a really great presentation and, a, and, a, and an overview of this strategy. And I have to say, I'm really proud of the work that's been done in that space by many members of the Women's Health Watermelly team. Um, and it yeah, just demonstrates the breadth and depth of the consultation and um, thought that went into that um, prevention strategy. So thank you for sharing. Um, just to let everyone know that if you do have any questions to, um, to ask, um, if you can pop them in the Q&A um, part of the chat, I don't think you can actually add anything into the, that chat section. Um, so just to clear that up with you all. Okay, so moving on, I'd now like to introduce to you all our keynote speaker, Anita Brown-Major. Anita, hi Anita. Hello all. Hello. So Anita is an occupational therapist with 25 years of experience in neurological rehabilitation with a passion for the recognition of all people as sexual beings. Anita has completed extensive research into the importance of sexuality, not just sex, but relationships, intimacy and self-esteem for people living with different abilities and bodies, ensuring a focus on quality of life. In 2016, Anita founded Thrive Rehab a small team of occupational therapists and sexual health nurses delivering client-centred support to a diverse community of clients. Now, Thrive Rehab recently created Clitorit, a 3D pull-apart model to support education for healthcare professionals, educators, clients and students. Clitorit accurately shows the interaction of the vulva, clitoris and pelvis and helps people of all abilities to understand 
AFAB, Assigned Female at Birth Anatomy. And this product will be available or was available in July 2023, so recently available. Um, Anita is a member of the International Clitorati, the Australian uh, Sexology Association, and the Australian Occupational Therapy Association. Thank you for joining us, Anita. We're thrilled to have you um, as our keynote speaker, and I'm going to pass it over to you for your presentation. Oh, thank you so much, Belinda. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So um, I very much appreciate being invited and sharing knowledge about sexual pleasure. It's such a, a joyous topic to be able to talk about. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and make sure that's working so everyone can see that. Great. Excellent. So living a sexual, I really get delighted to be asked to be talking about pleasure. Often I, I get, um, we, we get um, brought in often as OTs or sexual health um, people about when there's problems arrive. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to be talking about pleasure. Today we are talking about sexuality and, and sex and sexuality does have lots of different connotations for lots of different people. So I always put this slide up and um, these slides will be available afterwards as well as different organisations that you can contact yourself. Um, and certainly I even suggest even as professionals, if there's professionals here and um, someone is disclosing something that you're not quite sure what to do with, you can actually ring these organisations yourselves um, to go, this has just happened, what should I do? So you don't actually need to know all the questions or all, all the answers actually when you're talking about sexuality as a, as a profession. But th these are all great organisations that I'm, sh I'm sure most of you are aware of. I wanted to position myself. So I'm sitting on Wurundjeri land of uh, Kulin Nation, so based in Brunswick, Melbourne. Um, I did grow up in rural Victoria. So I grew up in a small country town called Kingupna, um, just north of Shepparton and south of uh, uh, Nimurka. Uh, um, and so I'm really quite passionate about rural health um, and have spent most of my career um, trying to work alongside rural folk um, and rural occupational therapists to be able to do this work. So not wanting to come in as the expert, but just actually telehealth has provided great mentoring and opportunities of working alongside other occupational therapists and other healthcare professionals, social workers, psychologists, so that we can provide support. So um, we're pretty excited to be, um, you know, and do a lot of work in rural Victoria. Uh, this is the uh, the other side of my business is Thrive Rehab. So we're a group of occupational therapists and sexual health nurses that mainly work in the NDIS space. Um, and we do a lot of work in the LGBTIQA plus um, community, um, work with a lot of uh, fabulous transgender humans um, and have got a really great team of, of therapists that are committed to doing this work and, and doing some education as such. So um, you can fr feel free to have a look at that. But a lot of our work is, again, working alongside. It's a terrible business model of mine because it's actually not working individually with clients, but it's actually working alongside other therapists to be able to feel like they can have conversations about sex and sexuality. Um, I really liked Catherine's presentation. It, it dovetails so nicely. It's almost like we'd planned this. Um, uh, Catherine um, was really talking about sexual and sexual health and pleasure. We know through the World Health Organization that that sexuality is more than just reproduction, um, and it influences the way we feel. It's influence. It's expressed in you know how we look, what makeup we wear or not wear. Um, you know, it, it's so much more. But we also know that it, that all of our concepts of sexuality is built, each one of us, it's built from the background that we have sat in and the processes that we've worked in. So it's influenced by our psychology, it's influenced by our biology, the historical context and where we sit, the, um, the ethical, the legal, the economic, cultural, all these different things impact our definition of sexuality personally and also how it influences our values. Um, and our values are really um, important to look at and to think about and to, to question um, while, when we're working in this area as well. Now, I always love this. We always talk about in health, whose role is it to talk about sex? And pretty much when I, you can, there's heaps of educations around this and heaps of articles of whose role, whose role, 
people talk to the doctors, the nurses, the OTs, you know, is it a specialist as such? And pretty much I would say it's actually everyone's role. It's And usually in a, a multidisciplinary healthcare network, it is who is that person feel most comfortable about? So when I we do training of healthcare professionals, we basically try and train everyone. I've even worked with dietitians in this area and they're like, why do I need to attend training, Anita? And um, I make, made everyone attend in, when we were working in hospitals. And the dietitian came and talked to me a couple of weeks later and said, oh, my God, Anita, um, I would never have picked up on, on a cue. Someone was asking me before they went on weekend leave, oh, I'm a bit worried about having enough energy for going home. And um, this dietitian said, I would never have picked up that they meant enough energy around being sexually active with my partner at home. Um, so, again, just allowing all professionals uh, basic understandings of sexual health and, and questions, allow questions to be asked. We know that um, most clients don't ask about sex. We also know that most health professionals don't ask about sex. So we've got this definition of both. So if you think about your own health journey, which we are going to be talking about, you know, when was the last time a doctor asked you about your sexual health? Um, when was the last time the physio did? When was the last time that you talked about that um, in all of our different ranges of, um, of life stages? So really thinking about who asks and who responds. Um, my parents are in their late 70s. All of their friends are now going to every different medical professional talking about sex and then reporting back to me. So I feel like I've got this whole plethora of people who literally, you know, grew up and were sexually active in the 60s, which are, you know, a lot more sexually liberated probably than my, um, you know, than my kids. So it's that real concept of, of not making assumptions. The joy that I get to talk to and, and think about today is to do the sex ed that maybe you never got around pleasure um, in schools. So we're going to go back to sex ed 101 and we're going to start with anatomy, physiology, information that unfortunately we don't get taught in schools. We also don't get taught in health professional universities. So that's a little bit my bent is how do we get this information? I will ask, if possible, to see if you can find a pen and a pencil, if you've got one on your table, because I will be getting you to do an activity um, as such, but we are going to do Sex Ed 101. So again, because we're in a webinar, I can't get you to respond, but I want you to think about or write down, what are the two largest sex organs in your body? Which is an interesting one to have a think about. So the two largest sex organs in your body. In the interest of time, I'm going to give you the answers. The first one oop, is your brain. So I know that sounds it's interesting, but your brain is where your orgasms happen. Your brain is where desire happens. Your brain is so important to the sexual response system. Um, it's essential as such. So someone, I work with lots of people with spinal cord injuries um, that might be a quadriplegic you know, they can still be sexually active beings. So your brain is your most important, one of your most important sex um, organs. Your second one is your skin. So again, we're not talking about genitals, Taylor, here. We will get to that. But your two most important things is your brain and your skin. So the feeling of touch. So if you think about disability or disease, which again, I overlay with everything, anything that affects the brain, or the skin has the potential to impact on sexual pleasure and sexual functioning. So really having a think about that. So this is where your pen and pencils are. So while I talk at you, I would like you to do a little bit of, I was going to say doodling, but it doesn't really sound right to say doodling in this context, but basically do some drawings and I would like you to draw a picture of the clitoris. It's okay if you don't know what that looks like, just give it a go. Try not to look it up just yet, but I would like you to get your pens and pencils out and draw what you think is a picture of the clitoris. Um, and we might even get you to take some photos and send it through to the organisers. I'm sure that they would love to receive multiple photos of clitorises from around the Lodden Mallee area. That would be fabulous. But we're going to go in with a bit more of the Sex Ed 101. So we're going right back to um, the study, uh, I suppose, of the sexual response system. Um, in the 1960s, there was a couple in the US um, uh, called Masters and Johnson. There is a Netflix series about it. So, um, and there's also a couple of really great Netflix series of sexual pleasure. 
But basically what I'm wanting to talk about the Masters and Johnson's work is, um, and it's very binary, so I'd like to very much acknowledge this work was done in the 1960s. So it's talking about um, people with penises as males and people with clitorises as females. It doesn't show the gender, uh, gender um, diversity in this at all. So it's basic on that. I also like to acknowledge that the Masters and Johnson's, although they did fabulous work in this area, also tried to do gay conversion and fix people. So there's a lot of questionable stuff around Masters and Johnson's, but it's a useful, um, they still were the, probably the first medical professionals to really map and study sexual the sexual response system. So I'm now talking about um, the process of um, having sex, masturbating um, as such. What they did is they got people to come into the hospital um, behind closed doors that they could see through and they hooked them up to lots of different electrodes on their body and they measured body responses. They measured heart rate, innovations, you know, what, what was going on within a body during a sexual response. And they got people to either masturbate um, or have sex, partnered sex. They like people to have partnered sex with someone they didn't know. So let's just put that into context as well. If you were asked to either go in, masturbate in front of someone or have partnered sex with someone you don't know. And their results basically were saying um, for people with penises, they had this excitement period. So that is a period where um, their muscle tension increased. So again, if I've had a stroke, my, mus my, my tone or my cerebral palsy might increase. Um, your heart rate increases. Um, blood flow is increased to be able to increase the um, the erections of the clitoris or, or the penis. Um, and you got to a point of plateau. Plateau is a period where it's all really heightened um, just before orgasm. And for most people with penises, they orgasmed and then they had a, ref a resolution period or what they call a refractory period, which is the time after orgasm that they cannot get another erection. So that's such. What they did map is that those people with clitorises would come in and would either go through this excitement phase and then just hit the plateau stage but not orgasm. And I think if I was asked to come in and have sex in front of someone that I didn't know, I probably would hit the I'm not going to orgasm concept. Um, or, But they actually did figure out that people with clitorises could have multiple orgasms. Um, what I find really important understanding of this system is that it helps us understand how disease or disability impacts on this as well. So we know that someone with a clit with a with a penis, this this process will be quite fast. You know, it can actually happen in, in quite a, a quick succession. Um, we know that for a clitoris to actually get expanded and to get erect, it often will take twenty to thirty minutes um, to be able to to get to a full erection of the clitoris. Interestingly, this also means that we can change how we do things. So I worked with a young woman who'd had a, had been sexually uh, had a head injury through a domestic violence injury, and she had very um, she as a result of her brain injury she had very tight abductors. So she used to spasm with her legs, and she couldn't actually spread her legs um, because of the spasming, um, and couldn't have partnered sex. So we talked a lot about this sexual response system, and we basically worked out that if her partner um, was able to provide her oral sex. She would go through this tightening of the muscles. She would orgasm. And we know that when you orgasm, there's a, a relaxation happens afterwards. So your muscles relax post that. Um, so her muscles would relax. She would then be able to spread her legs and then have partnered sex and have another orgasm. So knowing the body systems and how it works really helps us reform how our bodies work with each other um, and how do we develop and, and gather pleasure. So we know that the anatomy and physiology, we need innovation. So we need to have good um, nerves and blood supply, hormones and neurotransmitters all impact on our sexual response system. Um, if someone has diabetes, they all often have issues around their blood supply. So I often will say if you see in, their, um, in the medical history there's diabetes, there might be some impacts on their sexual response systems. It doesn't mean we can't do something about that, but again, it's an important question to be able to ask. Um, we know that hormones has large impacts around desire. Um, and I'd also like to, I suppose, point out that what Masters and Johnson's also completely missed was a concept of desire, you know, that, that pre the concept. So I could talk about this for a really, really long time, um, but I don't have the time.
But we do know that anything affects any of those body systems, which is basically all body systems, has the impact of impacting on our sexual um, functioning as such. Now, I know we can't show and tell. Maybe I should get the all the presenters who are on the things to show us theirs on their screen. Actually, let's try and do that. If you can, show us on your screen. I don't know whether you can, what those are. Um, and again, there's no shame in this. Excellent. Fabulous. Thank you. Awesome. Great, Tina. Um, if you do have your phones, grab them out and grab your camera out. And I've just got, this is a website that actually shows you, um, which is what we've done with Clitorate, of what you, the clitoris looks like as such. And then I'll show you after that. But if you can have a look at that. And that actually explains that I'm showing you that website because there's lots of explanations on the website that I don't have time to talk to you today, but it gives you an opportunity to have a look at that. But this is what an erect clitoris looks like. And most people don't know this and most um, health professionals don't know this as well. So the erect clitoris um, looks like this and the erect clitoris is the bulbs here. So a flaccid clitoris, which is what we're making shortly um, as well, is um, basically if you think about a deflated balloon, that's what a, 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 um, a deflated, you know, a, a flaccid clitoris would look like. So if we were going to do MRIs, of which we have done multiple times of, of, of people's bodies with clitorises, um, the clear, this is, again, not been report this has been incidental I, I've got this information from the International Clitorati um, which is a group of amazing medical professionals around the world that make different models and contribute to this but if we were going to MRI um, your um, your body and if, if you're a clitoris owner um, when a clitoris is erect it will glow white in, um, in on an MRI when it's not, not erect then it basically just doesn't show at all so and we actually know that when someone's actually a bit depressed the clitoris doesn't glow. So um, my 16 year old's daughter's friend said like, oh, so the, the clitoris is like a mood ring. And I was like, yeah, actually it's probably a really good point. So I love, love teenagers for coming up with concepts, but if you consider the clitoris a little bit like a mood ring. Um, we've, so again, knowledge of how bodies are put together, where the urethra is, where the vagina is, that it's not open all the time, that it needs to be warmed up and people orgasm. So although I'm saying the sexual response system is the brain and the skin, um, people orgasm in, in um, different positions because of their position of the clitoris. So some people will orgasm in a certain position where another person won't. And that's usually about how the makeup. So all our bodies are different. Every vulva is unique as someone's face um, and are all different. Um, the labia, so the inner labia um, uh, in through here is full of erectile tissue as well. So it's really important to know that that's actually part of the sexual response system or, or the, the sex organs is the inner labia. Um, and it's probably quite horrifying that we still experience a lot of labioplasties of people wanting to look normal because we actually don't know what a normal, you know, all labias are different. It is more normal to have a protruding labia. It is more normal to have a asymmetrical labia than it is to have um, basically what we see in the media, which is airbrush labias. And that's because there's a law of, against showing what a labia looks like. This is probably my aha moment and what I really wanted to be talking to you a lot about. And again, there's a trigger warning for sexual assault is there's two different ways of getting erections. So when I talk about erections, I talk about erections of the penis and the erections of the clitoris. Um, this is a flaccid clitoris up here um, through an MRI. Um, and what it's actually showing here is the cutting. So this is female genital mutilation. So again, really important to be able to show um, what, what body organs are doing. But basically, there's two ways of getting erections. There's the psychogenic way. So I think, I see, I smell something that gets me sexy. And the message comes from the brain, down the spinal cord, and out to the penis or the clitoris to get an erections. So that's the psychogenic erections. We also have a pathway, it's S2 to S4, which is your reflexgenic erections. So if I'm working with someone with a spinal cord injury, we still are able to get erections through this pathway of if you get touched um, or if there's some sort of a touch around your penis or your vagina, you can get an erection. So that means if someone is being catheterized in the hospital, they might get an erection um, on their penis. 
This is really important information to know because it doesn't mean consent. So an erect penis, a wet vagina, um, any sort of erection does not mean consent. It just means that you have this reflexogenic erections. And the aha moment I have for multiple people is often during sexual assault, people will get wet. Um, they can have orgasms during a sexual assault and it can really just screw with people's brains. So as all health professionals and for all people, we need to know these body systems so that we can debunk that and actually work on regaining pleasure after sometimes sexual assaults. Um, I worked with a, a, a young person who had a sexual um, a spinal cord injury and they just went, oh, well, I'm, 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 you know, been in jail for a year. And they said, oh, well, I'm homosexual now because I was raped multiple times and I got erections and I had orgasms. So I must have liked it. So again, trying to understand what is that body systems doing in the background really makes a, a massive difference in terms of getting people to explore their body and understand pleasure. So two ways to get erections thinking about the psychogenic erections and a reflex erections, which is, means um, non-concordant erections. So we, we call that non-concordance, that when you get wet, um, it does not mean that you're sexually excited. So the only way to know that you're really into this from a partner perspective is actually by communication. Are you liking this? Yes. Um, and we have the recent affirmative consent laws, you, it's actually talking out loud about that. Or if those people who are unable to communicate, working out a system beforehand on how that it works. Orgasms, talking about all the fun stuff. So we know these are all the facts. So um, the, there's a male, female, again, binary debate of, you know, is do orgasms, uh, do people experience orgasms differently in different bodies? Um, they basically got 300 people in a, in a study and they got everyone to write down their experience of an orgasm and they gave it to a panel of experts and said, go figure out, put them into two binary areas. And they couldn't do it because actually those experiences, when you write down the experiences of orgasms, are very similar. So really um, looking at that. We know that orgasms are perception of the sensation is context dependent. So if you're sitting next to a new date and it's pretty fun and you're, you know, feeling a bit sexy um, and they touch you on the on the shoulder, that's going to be a very different experience of if you're sitting next to, you know, a, a sibling who gives you a bit of a, you know, hit on the shoulder. So that really context of where you are and what that concept is really changes the headspace. As I said before, we know that multiple orgasms for people with clitorises are possible. We also know involuntary orgasms are possible. Um, or we know that men can organize, um, orgasm through prostate stimulation alone. So erectile dysfunction, um, you can still orgasm through um, prostate stimulation. We know that women are more likely to orgasm alone with a female partner or during oral sex. The stats are around about only 30% of people with clitorises will orgasm with penis vagina sex. Really important stat to know. Um, and we also know that orgasms can be redirected um, and can be occurred through different stimulations or erogenous zones. So a lot of the work that we do with people who have spinal cord injuries, we will actually work on trying to redirect their orgasms. So people have orgasm behind their ear or often even at the level of the spinal cord injuries. Um, so erogenous zones can change. So bodies change and understanding of where your bodies are, are sitting is really important. What I would really like to do, and I think this um, follows on very well from Catherine's conversation, is really the recognition of all people as sexual beings um, and how they choose to enact that is up to them. So people can still choose to be asexual or, you know, though that's not even choice, you know, that's who they are, um, but how they choose to enact that. But recognising and not making assumptions that just, um, and not just having conversations about sex with people who are young or in partnered. We know that I actually am really passionate about recognition of all people as sexual beings and that even children have the potential to become sexual beings and that consent and education is really important. Often kids with disabilities are forgotten 
or seen as asexual and not given this information. And unfortunately, that puts them at more risk of sexual assault. So we know that kids with disabilities have a higher rate of sexual assault. We know the stats are pretty horrifying for women with intellectual disabilities as a 75% um, rate of sexual assault. So it's a really high concept. We know that education and adapting education to their needs is really important. So um, we work a lot with special schools on actually providing education to folk about how do you get people with an AC device um, to be able to get this information um, and to, to also talk about it. We also talk a lot about body autonomy. So kids with disabilities or people with disabilities, children with disabilities are touched a lot. So it's very hard to recognise what is safe touch and what is, you know, you know, not safe touch if you actually are being picked up and moved and put on the toilet and lifted all the time. So really to teaching um, uh, t folk and carers how to actually teach body autonomy with, with that. We know that again, also on the other end of the spectrum, the aging that, you know, I've worked with lots of women who are in their eighties that have repartnered. And um, we had one of my uh, colleagues worked with a lady who had had a hysterectomy 20 years before and her partner died. She hooked up with another, with a friend um, and she went to the doctor and said, oh, um, is it still open? You know, again, not knowing the concept. So she was sent off to a friend who was a sexologist um, and basically most of our work is just education. This is your body. This is how it works. Um, and this woman reported her first ever orgasm in her 80s um, with her new partner. So this real concept of that it's not just for, the, you know, the young as such, that we are lucky to think about uh, having a sexually healthy life for all of us as we age. And often we know that more time becomes more pleasure. Um, one woman I worked with last year actually said erectile dysfunction was the best thing that ever happened to their sex life because he figured out other ways of being able to please her. Um, so that real concept of education and, and touch and communication is so important. Um, I worked with one woman who'd had a brain tumour who um, we, again, hadn't had a brain tumour and been in and out of hospital and I asked about sexuality and sex life with her and she just looked at me and just went, Oh, what? no one has ever talked to me in my five-year cancer journey about sex. And we had this really great discussion about how she'd had a really healthy sex life. She got married young. They had a great sexual script, but they never talked about sex. But last time I talked about sex was when I was a teenager. Um, and her partner, you know, was really worried about her being ill, didn't want to touch, didn't want her, her to assume that she was on sex, so just didn't touch her. So there was this disconnection of, I I don't want to crush you. I don't want to have expectations. I'm going to step away. And then they further and further away. And she, um, we basically, as a therapy concept, is just talk to her, how do you talk about sex? How do you talk about sex with your partner? Here's some information about cancer and sexuality. And a lot of that is about bringing back connection, bringing back conversations. And she came back and told me, um, wrote me an email a couple of weeks later that said that her and her partner had gone out on a date and they talked about sex and they'd worked out ways of basically keeping the pilot light on, um, how to hold um, hold hands. So often one of our biggest conversations is we ban penis vagina sex, but we encourage all the other bits about connection to be able to increase desire um, and, and have some, some healthy conversations. So again, it's about as yourselves as a sexual being, is talking about this, talking about it with your healthcare professionals. If you don't know, find out. We do Google doctor things. When uh, My recommendation when you Google, put PDF into your search criteria because you'll find out information that is accurate rather than if I, if I Google sexuality and stroke, um, you get some really weird shit that comes up through your search criteria. Um, apologies for swearing. Uh, but if you Google sexuality stroke PDF, you'll actually get some, um, you know, reference material. So there's some great information out there. I'm also quite um, passionate about all aspects of the, of the sexual um, life as such. People with who are, have dementia are still sexual beings. 
then not often we go saying, oh, they're acting like a three or four year old. So really that, that sense of pleasure is often one of the last biological processes to, uh, to go really and to deteriorate. Um, and I worked certainly with my aunt who had early onset dementia um, and sexuality was a really big part of her life. Um, and, it, it, you know, no healthcare professionals wanted to talk about it. So I just wanted to acknowledge, um, finishing up here, is that, is, you know, sexuality is intimate to our quality of life. And to be acknowledged as a sexual being, actually, you get seen as a human. Um, so I think it's really important um, in, in our conversations is to acknowledge ourselves as sexual beings and how you choose to express that is up to you. Um, and But educating yourself around that is really, really important um, and seeing that. And we know that the worst enemy of sexual health is silence. And that goes across all the, the walks that we do. And that is me. Thank you very much. Wow. Thanks so much, Anita. What a wonderful presentation. Um, I've made notes all along the way, so many learning opportunities um, for myself and I'm sure for many others in the room. Um, yeah, really informative and interesting. Um, I have to say that I did fail on the two most important organs. Um, yeah, so it certainly, you know, opened up my, my mind a lot more about um, understanding what sexual pleasure really means to, to different people. So thank you so much. Um, just wanted to check in as well to see whether there was any questions that had come up in the chat to our moderators. Did anything come up at all? Nothing's come up yet, but if anybody would like to add any questions in the Q&A section for Anita, um, please feel free and we'll get into those if we, when we can. Great. Um, Okay, well, we're going to move on um, to our panel discussion and uh, it's really great that our keynote speaker, Anita, will be joining us for that panel discussion. Um, and I'd like to introduce um, others who will also be joining us. So we have Dr. Karishma Kaur. Hello. Dr. Karishma Kaur is a general practitioner at Bendigo Community Health Services within the Sexual and Reproductive Health Hub and Bendigo Primary Care Centre. Uh, she is a graduate from India and moved to Australia to pursue higher qualifications. Karishma has worked in Harvey Bay Hospital as a medical registrar and then moved to Victoria to be closer to family. And since then, she's worked in various departments in Bendigo Health and also did a year as a rehabilitation registrar. Due to her immense interest in primary care, Karishma trained in various practices in Bendigo and attained fellowship at the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. And Karishma has a great connection with community and participates actively in local events. Uh, she's developed advanced skills in sexual and reproductive health and is trained to provide early pregnancy care, including unplanned pregnancies and early miscarriage management. Welcome. We Hi. also have Gabrielle Mentz. Gabriella is a health promotion officer with a background in adult education. She's passionate about sex education for adults to address the fear surrounding sexuality and gender in Australia. Uh, in 2021, Gabrielle completed a graduate certificate in sex, health and society, which was designed by the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe University. She has a certificate for in training and assessment and completed her first nationally accredited course in gender equity in Australia. And in 2022, we were very lucky because Gabrielle joined Women's Health Lotta Mallee as a health promoter in gender equality. Welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Rhiannon Jennings. Um, Rhiannon, otherwise known as Rhi, um, is the Rural Development Coordinator at Yakvik, uh, the Youth Affairs Council Victoria. Um, Really is passionate about empowering the next generation and hailing from a rural background, she's developed a deep understanding of the unique challenges faced by young people in rural areas. She's committed to fostering growth, advocating for young people's rights and improving access to crucial services and opportunities. Sexual reproductive health and wellbeing has first become a priority for Yakvik's Rural Presence Project in the Mallee. Uh, through their strong partnerships, such as with in South Lotta Mallee um, and the Centre for Excellence in Rural Sexual Health, SERSH, 
Um, Yakvik are involved in both leading and supporting a variety of sexual health focused initiatives across the Lotta Mallee region, including the co facilitated um, Sexual Health Out and About Shout Network uh, with SERSH. And Yakvik continues to bridge the gap by advocating for outreach programs, vital resources, and bringing localised support for rural young people. So, welcome everybody. What a great, amazing panel. I'm really excited for this part. So I'm keen to jump right into our discussion and I'm looking forward to hearing from you all um, about why her health matters and her pleasure matters. Um, so to get us into the space, um, everybody in the room, including those that we can't see, I think we just take a moment to reflect on our experiences with sex education and when we were growing up. And we don't need to say anything. But I'm sure many of us might be cringing a bit at the thought and can share probably very similar memories about sex education, focusing on reproductive anatomy um, rather than addressing the topics related to sexual pleasure, consent, relationships and overall mental health and wellbeing. So on that note, my first question to you all is why is women's pleasure not just a health issue but a social issue? And what are the advantages of people across the life course being educated around sexual health and pleasure? And I'm thinking that um, continuing on for the conversation, Nita, you might like to start us off. Yeah, look, I am I sort of feel like I've said a lot already about women's um, um, health pleasure. It's a social, it's a social issue because I think if we understand the pleasure, I, I think we're, People are often even not even I, unable to grasp. I think if you're a socialised female from a young age, it's, we don't actually think we often grasp the concept of that we're carers rather than seeking pleasure ourselves. So we're not encouraged to be um, seeking pleasure um, and we're not encouraged to explore our own pleasure. And I think that's actually a real disadvantage because then we're unable to actually understand what do our own bodies need, want, and, and how do we help with that concept. Um, so it, and it has a huge um, social issue around that because we know that, um, you know, domestic violence is a high and um, we don't have education around the concept of women's pleasure. We have most of our sex education comes from porn, unfortunately. We know that um, young people usually from 10 or 11 are, see, are getting their sex ed from porn um, and that has huge social implications because it doesn't show pleasure um, for those that are, you know, that are socialised or as, as women as such. Um, I rem yeah, I would like to pass it over. I think Gabrielle and I know that Ree had some great conversations around this as well. Fantastic. Yeah. Um sort of the advantages, thanks Anita, like the advantages of pleasure education, sort of what you were talking before about the pleasure gap, closing the pleasure gap um, and redefining, you know, women's sexuality. Like if I ask you all to think about what some of the stereotypes are about women's sexuality, I think you were talking about that sort of giving role. Um, you know, we're either too much or too little, we're sort of it's really hard for us to find that sweet spot when it comes to talking about our sexuality and how we mm -hmm. perceived. And there's other pleasure gaps to be closed as well. Like you spoke about older people and their sexuality. Um, they often get overlooked or ignored. Questions don't get asked. Mm -hmm. And for women with a disability as well. And I think, you know, for me, the biggest advantage about pleasure education is that sense of agency and bodily autonomy, you know, that you are able to make informed and in health promotion, you know, when we're, you know, preventing issues, we want people to make healthy decisions, you know, and how do you do that? You know, building confidence in yourself, knowing who you are, being able to react to a variety of, you know, situations and holding true to yourself. Um, and I think that's really our sexual agency is really important and learning about the positive aspects of sexuality help that. And I'm, um, there's a great study I found at recent 2022, because, you know, we've had this risk discourse, you know, don't fall pregnant, don't get an SDI, um, sexual dysfunction. And they found that people who have more pleasurable lives make better decisions. Isn't that great? And that sex education is more effective when we sort of 
putting that healthy perspective with it, people take it up better. So if we are in health promotion and we're wanting to prevent things from going wrong, let's talk about what goes right. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Gab. And I might pass over to you, Ree. What are your thoughts? Thanks, Belinda. I probably will now echo quite a lot of what An Anita and Gab have had to say in this space, but in many societies, women's sexual pleasure has just, it's always been marginalised. It's, it's historically been ignored. Cultural norms have perpetuated this stigma and shame, negative stereotypes that have primarily focused on men's men's pleasure, moving through the 50s and the 60s, you know, thinking to where we're at today, a reflection on where we've come from is, is really, really important. It's shaped the attitudes that we have towards sex and it's had a really far-reaching health issue or impact on our health, particularly for women, but also those social impacts around how we deliver that education is vitally important from my perspective uh, rurality and, and young people, if young people aren't receiving that education, where do they go? And and we acknowledged earlier that generationally that education, when we all reflected on our education, I saw around the room here a few little grimaces and, and funny looks on our faces. It, it was very limited. You know, visiting pleasure really promotes those healthy sexual relationships, safer sexual practices, and it improves our overall health and well-being. Our mental health is impacted as well. Anita mentioned earlier in one of her presentations, um, it, you know, this has been acknowledged and demonstrated also around commitments to improving domestic violence and respectful relationships. And we're seeing that coming through now uh, with affirmative consent models. Um, I might I might handball to Karishma because I, I don't want to take up all of the space. Thanks, Ree, and really great insights. And yes, really interested to hear your perspective, Karishma. <laughs> So working in the, so my main work is as a GP working in a sexual and reproductive hub. And I would say that hardly we ever get women who want to come and talk about their sexual health and pleasure. We do have lots of women who come and talk about, you know, um, uh, STIs and how to prevent that. But we don't see women come in and talk about their sexual pleasure or their sexual health as such. We do bring those discussions up certain times, but yes, I would agree, as Anita said, as health professionals, I don't think we provide that open space. Um, and um, I think it's a lot to do with both the, not only the health aspect, but the social aspect of it as well, because there is so many social norms and expectations that we are supposed to follow. Um, and lots of female, women feel it's going to be a huge stigma or it's shameful for me to go and express that I'm not getting pleasure with my partner. Um, it does tend to affect relationships. It does tend to affect the ability for of women to be able to give um, a consent or it doesn't, it affects their emotional well-being. I think the advantages of being able to educate them will um, you know, help them foster healthier relationships with their partner. They will also provide, um, you know, emotional well-being for them. I think it will give them more, um, you know, it will empower them to be able to make healthy decisions for their bodies. They'll be able to say whether they, you know, whether it's fertility related or pregnancy related, whether they want to have it, don't have it. I think talking about pleasure, sex, starting from an earlier age, but then continuing it, continuing it throughout life like we've gained so much just listening to Anita today mm. um, it is something that we need to do ongoing and we all in every aspect of life whether we're teachers whether we are you know um, health professionals um, sexologists counselors everyone needs to be comfortably be able to talk about sex absolutely and, and you mentioned about um, shame and stigma and, and, it, and it really does hold a big place when we talk about sex and sexuality and sexual pleasure and so it is a significant barrier in accessing sexual reproductive health services for many people of all ages and backgrounds um, and then also talking about sex can also be half of people regardless of their age or their backgrounds um, so I'm wondering um, if you could share with us some strategies for destigmatizing conversations and opening discussions about 
sex and sexual pleasure and whether you wanted to continue that conversation first off, Rishma. Yeah, so, so as I said, I think it's really important uh, to, to change the society attitudes towards sex and pleasure. I think the most important thing that Anita has highlighted today is to be able to provide that comprehensive sexual education to um, you know, different um, age groups, different societies, different backgrounds. Uh, there is talk about providing sex education. I think there's a huge gap in that sex education, which happens at schools. But I think we don't need to only focus about safe sex and we don't need to focus about STIs. I do see a lot of youngsters who are happy and feel very comfortable coming in and getting an STI check, but there should be more education about pleasure. The, you know, whatever Anita's highlighted today in terms of the, um, you know, pleasure that women get and how they can get or, you know, that all needs to be started at a very early age. Um, I think the other things important are that we need to normalize conversations. Everyone should be able to normally come and talk to their health professional to their, whether they're seeing a counselor, whether they're seeing a GP, the health professionals need to be educated. So cool. we when we get training, when I'm trained through the Royal College of Physici uh, General Practitioners, I have limited training in her terms of how to do, how to take sexual health history. And then we're talking about another complex, um, you know, type of thing here where we want to go and confidently ask women, give and other people to, and give them that safe space, come and talk to us about your needs. That is, if, if you're able to do that, um, it will also help us develop, um, you know, certain um, materials that we can give to young people and to people of any age um, so that they can continue to learn about sex in their bodies. I think one thing that I uh, really liked about what was highlighted uh, probably for a little bit was the media. I think the media plays a big role in not positive, in not creating a positive attitude about sex. I think if health professionals or professionals like Anita are able to talk about it openly and media promotes things like that, it will normalize situations and it will actually bring about a lot of sex education. Yeah, absolutely. You spoke quite a bit about young people. So I'm wondering, Re, whether you'd like to add to this discussion. And then I'm really interested to hear, Anita, what your thoughts are in this space as well. Thank you. It, it's it's such an interesting space, particularly for young people, and, and we've been we've had the privilege of engaging in consultation with young people across the Mallee in uh, really quite rural or remote spaces. You know, to be able to engage with them uh, around their education, and quite often it's it's significantly limited. What I would say, what charisma certainly has in an abundance is a confidence, a confidence to have a conversation, a necessary conversation. And the conversations that we've had with young people have predominantly lacked in pleasure. What we hear from our young people, particularly when we're talking around a continuum of consent, it starts at non-consensual and ends in consensual. And in no place, no way, shape or form is pleasure actually discussed. A healthy relationship is based on engaging in pleasurable activities. And again, there's so many stereotypes that have impacted young people in particular, but also acknowledging the diversity of the region that we live in. We are extraordinary in what we have to offer across the, the broader Lod Mallee region and the culture, the religion, the lived experience of um, our communities is really quite extensive. So being able to acknowledge what our communities and that diversity looks like is really, really important. For me, I have the privilege of working with young people, but we also need to make those considerations as well around the diversity of the community and how that impacts young people, how we engage in a really confidently and, and positive way. And it's okay for us as a youth worker, I'm not a sexual health professional, but I'm certainly very passionate about bringing that information and opportunity to young people. 
it's okay to acknowledge we don't always get it right and we don't always know all of the answers. But if we can build a confidence in our young people and establish where they can go to find the answers that they're looking for, reliable resources, and, and what some of the barriers are in accessing those resources, particularly where rurality is concerned, so many things that those complexities of rural living have an impact upon young people and the broader community more widely. A access to products and services is really significantly impacted. And that seems to be a bit gendered as well. The impact is more significant for young women. We're fortunate in 2019 when we had these conversations it's maybe unfortunate that not a lot has changed in that time, but looking at contraceptive options for healthy sexual relationships, what's available on the market. Male condoms are really easily accessible, but when we look at a female version or option for young women, they can access a male condom, but not necessarily a dam or perhaps a female condom. When we look at... Um, and Charisma and Gab would, would testify, I think, the complexity for, for a young woman and the responsibility, the burden of responsibility that falls to a young woman or a woman at any age, really, in having to put themselves out. They go to the GP. They go to the pharmacy. Um, those options are often scripted. They come at a cost. They come mm -hmm. at the expense of travel in many cases. And I think what's often not considered with rurality is that those services and access to products are quite often uh, impacted by the ability to travel, their outreach, their in the next regional centre, which is sometimes an hour or an hour and a half drive. If we Absolutely. think about the social impacts, there's a lot to consider. There is a lot to consider. And so, Anita, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are around that um, you know, there's all those all those different layers and does stigma, this is just a little bit off topic, but does stigma look differently for men and for women? I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think that stigma is all around us. It's in every media concept that you look at. It's in, you know, we 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 are born, we are socialised. This is the, the the conversations just don't happen. We're in a vacuum. So having open conversations I think has is is life changing and having open conversations with my 83 year old uncle, you know, and talking about sexual pleasure for his new partner, um, is also important. So that having that cross generate, you know, it, it it's important for all to understand bringing everyone along the journey. I think to destigmatize things, we particularly need to understand how people gather and access information, particularly rurally. And that people will want different sorts of information. And so how do we provide that? So how do we as organisations provide what we like to call in, health, in, in Thrive is a menu option. Like what are the information that you want to know and how do you want to get that information? So a lot of the folk that we work with that are neurodiverse, um, we know the, the evidence is around not everyone will want to get information the same way. Yeah, um, absolutely. But maybe you get that information. But, so we talk about... Do you want to read about it? Do you want to watch it? Do you want to look, um, uh, do you want to talk about it? Or do you want to do something else? You know, do you want to see, touch, feel? So a lot of that conversation for destigmatization is about access to good quality information, but it's also about knowing that you can actually find it in the first place. So looking at media, like, you know, I, I do go back to media, but just how do we enact more, more macro changes? Um, Fiona, who I work with in Clitorate, has got lives with severe endometriosis, um, and her brother is a is a TV producer. So he actually wrote in a character who had endometriosis in um, one of his productions um, of Reverend. So really thinking about how do you how do we get conversations about pleasure and sexual pleasure? Like how do we push the envelope out there, and how do people find out information in in different ways? So how do we have pamphlets? That are in the you know we can't have the conversations for everyone but do we actually have a pamphlet or something on the website or pointing to you know social media is everywhere how do we how do we you know infiltrate um mm. that information yeah thank you and you know 
what we're talking, you know, living regionally and rurally, we do know the, that it has additional impact on access to safe, affordable and appropriate sexual reproductive health care, but also health information. Um, and then we've touched on diversity and, you know, we know that those that live with a disability, migrant and refugee women, First Nations women and the LGBTIQA plus community can be further impacted. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need to be thinking about how we are more inclusive in addressing sexual health needs of women from different backgrounds. And so I might just start with you, Gavin, whether you've got some insights into what we can be doing to be more inclusive um, in this space. Thanks, Belinda. I love a good list. And I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether my list is a bit long, but never mind. <laughs> never think... be too long. <laughs> Uh, the first thing on my list is sort of it starts with yourself like if you're dealing with people it's examining your own worldview and having some critical reflection about what your ideas about sexual health and sexuality are um, and how that's impacting the kind of questions you ask or are not asking or you know so how do you define sex you know does that involve mostly genitals are you acknowledging the brain and the skin and the different parts you know, is it a particular act? And these kinds of questions. Um, what else? How does gender influence the questions you ask or don't ask? What stereotypes and assumptions are you making? And what conscious or unconscious biases do you have? So that first step is the critical reflection. The next step is to think about who's being excluded because of that. Um, and addressing the needs of women from different backgrounds. And sometimes, you know, we're expected to know all the answers and, and we don't. So reach out to those organizations and partners who do know and see what resources they have that you can use. Um, so for example, if you're using a translator for a woman of a migrant and refugee background, is that translator comfortable with talking about sexual health topics? Because that can sometimes shut down the conversation as well. Um, you know, so consult with community, find out what their needs are. Um, and I think Anita's already spoken about this one, educate yourself, anatomy, sexual and reproductive hormones across the life course, sexuality, sexuality and aging, with disability, all of the different things. You know, don't rely on the person with lived experience to be the educator. Yeah, and really amazing points, Gav. Gabrielle, um, sorry, I think I might have cut you off. I think you had something else to add there, so I'm going to let you continue. Um, I think, you know, if I'm going to finish up on my list, I can post my list up in the in the final email that we send out to everyone, so don't worry. Uh, it's just wonderful. It might be better. I'm just going to finish up with you. Be curious, ask questions, start the conversation, and reach out for help if you need it. You know, some people look around the room, love talking about this. That's great. And I might pass over to um, Ree. What are your thoughts? It, it, inclusion is, is so very important. And again, that acknowledgement of the diversity, understand that there are a variety of cultural and societal norm, norms, religious norms, expectations, and just do your best to be aware acknowledge that we're not we're not experts in everything but also in rural communities we have a there's a strength of community that that exists and there is an opportunity to develop confidence if you don't have that confidence yourself there are so many amazing services of support like women's health lot and Malu, like center for excellence in rural sexual health that can bring those experiences and expertise if we're thinking about a confidence particularly for young people in education, and, and I guess it really it, it, it's for every age in that education, look at bringing somebody in. Um, for young people, it, inclusion can be challenging based on, well, my teacher is my my dad's footy coach or, you know, there there is less than six degrees of separation. There are challenges for young people to be in included when they feel as though there's a lack of confidence or or a lack of um, confidentiality. There are, there are many layers that need to be considered when we're trying to include everyone. Do your best and yeah, reach, right. out to, reach out to your friends. I love that. Do your best. That's 
that's the best we can do. It's making the effort and making the attempt, yeah, and not feeling scared to, to do that, yeah. Um, Karishma, would you like to go next? Well, I think a lot has been covered, but just to add there, I think the most important thing is not to make assumptions is what I would say. Uh, it's very easy to assume that, you know, this person comes from so-and-so background, so they don't want to talk about sex because it's not something that they do when they grow up. Uh, coming from a different uh, country, settling in, there is a lot of stigma if I go back to India that you don't talk about sex openly, but doesn't mean that I don't want to talk about sex. So I think it's about the same thing. Provide the same space for everyone. Don't assume that they don't want to talk about it. If you're not sure about things, go ask. Go ask someone who works with it. Um, and I think... Um, to be able to engage different communities, you can reach out to your local uh, community leaders who can really help you in engaging a whole different community with you. Um, I think in my practice, the way we work is sometimes, um, you know, someone, a doctor would see a patient and say, Indian background doesn't speak, speaks English, but it's health education is quite complex as compared to be able to speak a simple sentence in English so do you want to see this patient so I think it makes a lot of sense if we can make workplaces especially workplaces dealing with different communities more diverse as well that provides a safer space people feel very comfortable coming in to that kind of a space where they say you know a Chinese person there an Asian person an Indian person they feel that yes we are more welcomed and same as being gender diverse in your clinic be more welcoming and provide more, um, you know, engagement with local community. Like I would say that if possible, um, especially if you are in smaller regional areas, go and engage with your community, go attend, you know, events. That means people have seen your face. Young people, Ray, I would say you'll agree that feel more confident if they've seen you somewhere. Um, not too long ago, Benega Community Health uh, did an advertisement on TV where it, I was in it and I had lots of people come in. Hey, you were the doctor who was on TV the other day. So it just helps you engage with the community uh, really well. So that that is something that will help us engage with everyone. Yeah, right. really great points. And we'll would love to see the ad. <laughs> so it's not on air it. anymore. <laughs> Um, Anita, is there anything that um, hasn't already been mentioned? There's been some really great points, but anything else that you'd like to add? Look, I think there's great points in terms of, I think we really come back into this whole conversation is don't make assumptions about anything. So don't make assumptions about culture. Um, don't make assumptions ab ab about gender too. So the, even the way you structure your conversations can make things more welcoming of, you know, who do you live with rather than do you have a partner or, you know, do you have a, a husband or a wife? So just some mm -hmm. of those conversation points can really shut down things very quickly or can open up and my biggest thing is um like it's just reflecting all the, the same I, I work in western um area of melbourne so i use lots of interpreters but again it is assumptions are so easily transcended of um with disability or with culture i worked with one woman who they had talked the neuropsychs had been involved she'd had a head injury she was non-speaking and the assumption was that you know that she was a, not a sexual being they figured out you know that she was getting a bit horny as they would say um and so i was brought in to do sex toys but actually when we sat down and worked through the concept no one had talked about menopause with this family and this woman couldn't talk about it themselves so it was again trying to figure out there's not the assumptions of why you've been brought in and that we don't need to know it all. I, you know, if someone wants to get back to playing golf, I've never played golf in my life. I, I don't need to know how to play golf to go, oh, that's a really important activity. Let me find someone who can help us with that. So really not making assumptions of what that person wants to do, how they want to be. Um, but the bottom line is just be respectful. Ask questions. How do you want to be referred to? What would you like to be asked about? This is an option. These are your options. Um, what would you like is, is the biggest concepts. Wonderful. Great takeaways. No assumptions and be respectful. Well, we are on to our very final question for, for this discussion and the discussion's been fabulous so far. Um, and this might be the trickiest one because it's in one sentence. In the context of sustainability and long-term progress, how can you, can you describe 
what success looks like in sexual and reproductive health space for women in rural and regional communities. So in one sentence, which is really hard. I'll maybe let you do two if you need to, but um, who would like to start us off? Does anyone have an answer? Perhaps Gab, do you want to start us off? Sure, I'll start us off. Um, you know, for me, long-term success is culture change and rewriting the script, which begins with starting the conversation now. So, you know, talk to us at Women's Health Lord and Mali about what those long-term goals for your organisation are and how we can work together to achieve them. Great. Thanks, Gab. Brielle. <laughs> And Anita? I think long-term success is actually talking, communication, open open and respectful communication is long-term uh, concept. And I have multiple things I could say, you know, key performance indicators of what we want to change, um, but having open and respectful communication around sexual pleasure and putting it on the map is, is really important. Thanks, Anita. Uh, Karishma? So I, I would say there needs to be um, an equitable access uh, to healthcare, education, um, support, so that we are able to empower uh, individuals to make informed choices about themselves. And this should be irrespective of where they are. So it should not depend on what their geographical uh, locations. It should be available to everyone everywhere. Wonderful. And last but not least, Lee. Empowered and informed is is what comes to mind. Empowered and informed allows this generation to educate the next, to have confidence, to have the important conversations. Fabulous. Thank you very much, panellists. Um, wow, what a fantastic and enriching discussion um, about all things sexual reproductive health. Um I do have noticed that we do have a question, but we are running out of time and I, I'm really respectful of the time that you've taken out to be with us. So we will get back to you. Um, but thank you everyone who's zoomed in to join with us and celebrate the launch of the Her Health Matters strategy. Um, before you leave today, an evaluation link has been popped in the chat to capture feedback from today's event, as well as any other uh, comments you may have about the strategy. And we'd really appreciate you taking the time to fill that out. Um, your feedback helps guide our future work. And those who might be watching this recording post today's event in the future um, can partake, partake in the evaluation as well. There'll be a link um, that will be supplied in the video description when we post that up. But that concludes our event for today. Um, please remember to share the strategy and reach out if you'd like to continue the conversation with us. But thank you. It's been a real pleasure to be with you all today and have a wonderful rest of day. <laughs>